Section 79 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan section seventy nine the diamond fields of south africa about eighteen seventy by anthony trollope the first known finding of a diamond in south africa was as recent as eighteen sixty seven and this diamond was found by accident and could not for a time obtain any credence it is first known to have been seen at the house of a dutch farmer named jacobs in the northern limits of the cape colony and south of the orange river it had probably been brought from the bed of the stream or from the other side of the river the other side would be in griqua land west the land of diamonds as far as i can learn there is no idea that diamonds have been deposited by nature in the soil of the cape colony proper at jacobs's house it was seen in the hands of one of the children by another boer named van Nikirk who observing that it was brighter and also heavier than other stones and thinking it to be too valuable for a plaything offered to buy it but the child's mother would not sell such a trifle and gave it to van Kirk. from van Kirk it was passed on to one o'reilly who seems to have been the first to imagine it to be a diamond he took it to cape town where he could get no faith for his stone and thence back to collisburg on the northern extremity of the colony where it was again encountered with ridicule but it became matter of discussion and was at last sent to dr atherston of grahamstown who was known to be a geologist and a man of science he surprised the world of south africa by declaring the stone to be an undoubted diamond it weighed over twenty-one carats and was sold to sir p woodhouse the then governor of the colony for five hundred pounds in eighteen sixty eight and eighteen sixty nine various diamonds were found and the search for them was no doubt instigated by van de kirk's and o'reilly's success but nothing great was done nor did the belief prevail that south africa was a country richer in precious stones than any other region yet discovered those which were brought to light during these two years may i believe yet be numbered and no general belief had been created but some searching by individuals was continued the same van de kirk who had received the first diamond from the child not unnaturally had his imagination fired by his success either in eighteen sixty eight or eighteen sixty nine he heard of a large stone which was then in the hands of a kaffir witch doctor from whom he succeeded in buying it giving for it as the story goes all his sheep and all his horses but the purchase was a good one for a dutchman's flocks are not often very numerous or very valuable and he sold the diamond to merchants in the neighborhood for eleven thousand two hundred pounds it weighed eighty-three carats and is said to be perfect in all its appointments as to water shape and whiteness it became known among diamonds and was christened the star of south africa after a lawsuit during which an interdict was pronounced forbidding its exportation or sale it made its way to the establishment of messrs hunt and roskill from whom it was purchased for the delight of a lovely british countess even then the question whether this part of south africa was diamond diamondifarious had not been settled to the satisfaction of persons who concerned themselves in the produce and distribution of diamonds there seems to have been almost an anti-south african party in the diamond market as though it was too much to expect that from a spot so insignificant as this corner of the orange and vaal rivers should be found a rival to the time-honored glories of brazil and india it was too good to believe or to some perhaps too bad that there should suddenly come a plethora of diamonds from among the hottentots it was in eighteen seventy that the question seems to have got itself so settled that some portion of the speculative energy of the world was enabled to fix itself on the new diamond fields in that year various white men set themselves seriously to work in searching the banks of the Vaal up and down between hebron and cliffdrift or barclay as it is now called 
and many small parcels of stones were brought from natives who had been instigated to search by what they had already heard the operations of those times are now called the river diggings in distinction to the dry diggings which are works of much greater magnitude carried on in a much more scientific manner away from the river and which certainly are in all respects dry enough but at first the searchers confined themselves chiefly to the river bed and to the small confluence of the river scraping up into their mining cradles the shingles and dirt they had collected and shaking and washing away the grit and mud till they could see by turning the remaining stones over with a bit of slate on a board whether fortune had sent on that morning a peculiar sparkle among the lot i was taken up to barclay on a picnic as people say and a very nice picnic it was one of the pleasantest days i had in south africa the object was to show me the val river and the little town which had been the capital of the diamond country before the grand discovery at colesburg cobbed had made the town of kimberley there is nothing peculiar about barclay as a south african town except that it is already half deserted there may be perhaps a score of houses there most of which are much better built than those at kimberley they are made of rough stone or of mud and whitewash and if i do not mistake one of them had two stories there was a hotel quite full although the place is deserted and clustering round it were six or seven idle gentlemen all of whom were or had been connected with diamonds i am often struck by the amount of idleness which persons can allow themselves whose occupations have diverged from the common work of the world when at barclay we got ourselves and our provisions into a boat so that we might have our picnic properly under the trees at the other side of the river for opposite to barclay is to be found the luxury of trees as we were rowed down the river we saw a white man with two kaffirs poking about his stones and gravel on a miner's rickety table under a little tent on the beach he was a digger who had still clung to the river business a frenchman who had come to try his luck there a few days since on the monday previous we were told he had found a thirteen carat white stone without a flaw this would be enough perhaps to keep him going and almost to satisfy him for a month had he missed that one stone he would probably have left the place after a week now he would go on through days and days without finding another sparkle i can conceive no occupation on earth more dreary hardly any more demoralizing than this of perpetually turning over dirt in quest of a peculiar little stone which may turn up once a week or may not i could not think as i watched the man of the comparative nobility of the work of a shoemaker who by every pull at his thread is helping to keep some person's foot dry after dinner we walked along the bank and found another river digger though this man's claim might perhaps be removed a couple of hundred yards from the water he was an englishman and we stood a while and talked to him he had one kaffir with him to whom he paid seven shillings a week and his food and he had found one or more stones which he showed us just enough to make the place tenable he had got upon an old digging which he was clearing out lower he had however in one place reached the hard stone at the bottom in or below which there could be no diamonds there was however a certain quantity of diamondiferous matter left and as he had already found stones he thought that it might pay him to work through the remainder he was a most good-humoured well-mannered man with a pleasant fund of humour when i asked him of his fortune generally at the diggings he told us among other things that he had broken his shoulder-bone at the diggings which he displayed to us in order that we might see how badly the surgeon had used him he had no pain to complain of or weakness but his shoulder had not been made beautiful and who did it said the gentleman who was our amphiterian at the picnic and is himself one of the leading practitioners of the fields i think it was one doctor said the digger naming our friend whom no doubt he knew i need not say that the doctor loudly disclaimed ever having had previous acquaintance with the shoulder the kaffir was washing the dirt in a rough cradle separating the stones from the dust and the owner as each sieveful was brought to him threw out the stones on his table and sorted through them with the eternal bit of slate or iron formed into the shape of a trowel 
for the chance of a civil one of our party offered him half a crown which he took i was glad to see it all inspected without a diamond as had there been anything good the poor fellow's disappointment must have been great that half crown was probably all that he would earn during the week all that he would earn perhaps for a month then there might come three or four stones in one day i should think that the tedious despair of the vacant days could hardly be compensated by the triumph of the lucky minute these river diggers have this in their favor that the stones found near the river are more likely to be white and pure than those which are extracted from the mines the vol itself in the neighborhood of berkeley is pretty with rocks in its bed and islands and trees on its banks but the country around and from thence to kimberley which is twenty-four miles distant is as ugly as flatness barrenness and sand together can make the face of the earth the commencement of diamond digging as a settled industry was in eighteen seventy two it was then that dry digging was commenced which consists of the regulated removal of ground found to be diamondiferous and of the washing and examination of every fraction of the soil the district which we as yet know to be so specially gifted extends up and down the vol river from the confluence of the modder to hebron about seventy-five miles and includes a small district on the east side of the river here within twelve miles of the river and within a circle of which the diameter is about two and a half miles are contained all the mines or dry diggings from which have come the real wealth of the country i should have said that the most precious diamond yet produced one of two hundred and eighty-eight carats was found close to the river about twelve miles from berkeley this prize was made in eighteen seventy two it is of the dry diggings that the future student of the diamond fields of south africa will have to take chief account the river diggings were only the prospecting work which led up to the real mining operations as the washing of the gullies in australia led to the crushing of quartz and to the sinking of deep mines in search of alluvial gold of these dry diggings there are now four dutois pan Bufutin, old de beers and colossberg cobbed or the great kimberley mine which though last in the field has thrown all the other diamond mines into the shade the first working at the three first of these was so nearly simultaneous that they may almost be said to have been commenced at once i believe however that they were in fact opened in the order i have given bulfontines and dutois pan were on two separate boer farms of which the former was bought first as early as eighteen sixty nine by a firm who had even then had dealings in diamonds and who no doubt purchased the land with reference to diamonds here some few stones were picked from the surface but the affair was not thought to be hopeful the diamond searchers still believed that the river was the place but the dutch farmer at dutois pan one van week finding that precious stones were found on his neighbors's land let out mining licenses on his own land binding the miners to give him one-fourth of the value of what they found this however did not answer and the miners resolved to pay some small monthly sum for a license or to jump the two farms together now jumping in south african language means open stealing a man jumps a thing when he takes what does not belong to him with a tacit declaration that might makes right appeal was then made to the authorities of the orange free state for protection and something was done but the diggers were too strong and the proprietors of the farms were obliged to throw open their lands to the miners on the terms which the men dictated the english came at the end of eighteen seventy one just as the system of dry digging had formed itself at these two mines and from that time to this dutois pan and bulfontine had been worked as regular diamond mines i did not find them especially interesting to a visitor each of them is about two miles distant from kimberley town and the centre of the one can hardly be more than a mile distant from the centre of the other they are under the inspection of the same government officer and might be supposed to be part of one and the same enterprise were it not that there is a mining board at dutois pan whereas the shareholders at bulfontine have abstained from troubling themselves with such an apparatus they trust the adjustment of any disputes which may arise to the discretion of the government inspector at each place there is a little village 
very melancholy to look at consisting of hotels or drinking bars and the small shops of the diamond dealers everything is made of corrugated iron and the whole is very mean to the eye there had been no rain for some months when i was there and as i rode into dutois pan the thermometer showed over ninety degrees in the shade and over one hundred and fifty degrees in the sun while i was at kimberley it rose to ninety six degrees and one hundred and sixty one degrees there is not a blade of grass in the place and i seemed to breathe dust rather than air at both these places there seemed to be a mighty maze in which they differ altogether from the kimberley mine which i will attempt to describe presently out of the dry dusty ground which looked so parched and ugly that one was driven to think that it had never yet rained in those parts were dug in all directions pits and walls and roadways from which and by means of which the dry dusty soil is taken out to some place where it is washed and the debris examined carts are going hither and thither each with a couple of horses and kaffirs above and below not very much above or very much below are working for ten shillings a week and their diet without any feature of interest what is done at dutois pan is again done at bultfontein at dutois pan there are one thousand four hundred and forty one mining claims which are possessed by two hundred and fourteen claim holders the area within the reef that is within the wall of rocky and earthy matter containing the diamondiferous soil is thirty one acres this gives a revenue to the Griqualand government of something over two thousand pounds for every three months about seventeen hundred kaffirs are employed in the mine and on the stuff taken out of it at wages of ten shillings a week and their diet which at the exceptionally high price of provisions prevailing when i was in the country costs about ten shillings a week more the wages paid to white men can hardly be estimated as they are only employed in what i may call superintending work they may perhaps be given as ranging from three to six pounds a week the interesting feature in the labor question is the kaffir this black man whose body is only partially and most grotesquely clad and who is what we mean when we speak of a savage earns more than the average rural laborer in england over and beyond his board and lodging he carries away with him every saturday night ten shillings a week in hard money with which he has nothing to do but to amuse himself if it so pleases him at bullfontein there are one thousand twenty six claims belonging to one hundred and fifty three claim holders the area producing diamonds is twenty two acres the revenue derived is six thousand pounds a year more or less about thirteen hundred kaffirs are employed under circumstances as given above the two diggings have been and are still successful though they have never reached the honour and glory and wealth and grandeur achieved by that most remarkable spot on the earth's surface called the colesberg cobbed the new rush or the kimberley mine i did not myself make any special visits to the old de beers mine de beers was the farmer who possessed the lands called Warsweet, of the purchase of which i have already spoken and he himself with his sons for a while occupied himself in the business but he soon found it expedient to sell his land the old de beers mine being then established as the sale was progressing a lady on the top of a little hill called the colesberg cobbed poked up a diamond with her parasol dr atherston who had visited the locality had previously said that if new diamond ground was found it would probably be on this, this spot in september eighteen seventy two the territory of Griqualand west became a british colony and at the time miners from the whole district were congregating themselves at the hill and that which was at once called the new rush was established in australia where gold was found here or there the miners would hurry off to the spot and the place would be called this or that rush the new rush the colesberg cobbed pronounced copy and the kimberley mine are one in the same place it is now within the town of kimberley which has in fact got itself built around the hill to supply the wants of the mining population kimberley has in this way become the capital and seat of government for the province as the mine is one of the most remarkable spots on the face of the earth i will endeavour to explain it with some minuteness the colesberg hill is in fact hardly a hill at all what little summit may once have entitled it to the name having been cut off 
on reaching the spot by one of the streets from the square you see no hill but are called upon to rise over a mound which is circular and looks to be no more than the debris of the mine though it is in fact the remainder of the slight natural ascent it is but a few feet high and on getting to the top you look down into a huge hole this is the kimberley mine you immediately feel that it is the largest and most complete hole ever made by human agency at dutois pan and bolfontine the works are scattered here everything is so gathered together and collected that it is not at first easy to understand that the whole should contain the operations of a large number of separate speculators it is so completely one that you are driven at first to think that it must be the property of one firm or at any rate be entrusted to the management of one director it is very far from being so in the pit beneath your feet hard as it is at first to your imagination to separate it into various enterprises the persons making or marring their fortunes have as little connection with each other as have the different banking firms in lombard street there too the neighborhood is very close and common precautions have to be taken as to roadway fires and general convenience you are told that the pit has a surface area of nine acres but for your purposes as you will care little for diamondiferous or non-diamondiferous soil the aperture really occupies twelve acres the slope of the reef around the diamond soil has forced itself back over an increased surface as the mine has become deeper the diamond claims over nine acres you stand upon the marge and there suddenly beneath your feet lies the entirety of the kimberley mine so open so manifest and so uncovered that if your eyes were good enough you might examine the separate operations of each of the three or four thousand human beings who are at work there it looks to be so steep down that there can be no way to the bottom other than the aerial contrivances which i will presently endeavour to explain it is as though you were looking into a vast bowl the sides of which are smooth as should be the sides of a bowl while round the bottom are various marvellous incrustations among which ants are working with all the usual energy of the ant tribe and these incrustations are not simply at the bottom but come up the curves and slopes of the bowl irregularly half way up perhaps in one place while on another side they are confined quite to the lower deep the pit is two hundred and thirty feet deep nearly circular though after a while the eye becomes aware of the fact that it is oblong at the top the diameter is about three hundred yards of which two hundred and fifty cover what is technically called blue meaning diamondiferous soil near the surface and for some way down the sides are light brown and as blue is the recognized diamond color you will at first suppose that no diamonds were found near the surface but the light brown has been in all respects the same as the blue the color of the soil to a certain depth having been affected by a mixture of iron below this everything is blue all the constructions in the pit having been made out of some blue matter which at first sight would seem to have been carried down for the purpose but there are other colors on the wall which give a peculiar picturesqueness to the mines the top edge as you look at it with your back to the setting sun is red with the gravel of the upper reef while below in places the beating of the rain and running of water has produced peculiar hues all of which are a delight to the eye as you stand at the edge you will find large high raised boxes at your right hand and at your left and you will see all round the margin crowds of such erections each box being as big as a little house and higher than most of the houses in kimberley these are the first recipients for the stuff that is brought up out of the mine and behind these so that you will often find that you have walked between them are the whims by means of which the stuff is raised each whim being worked by two horses originally the operation was done by hand windlasses which were turned by kaffirs and the practice is continued at some of the smaller enterprises but the horse whims are now so general that there is a world of them round the claim the stuff is raised on aerial tramways and the method of an aerial tramway is as follows wires are stretched taut from the wooden boxes slanting down to the claims at the bottom never less than four wires for each box two for the ascending and two for the descending bucket as one bucket runs down empty on one set of wires 
another comes up full on the other set the ascending bucket is of course full of blue the buckets were at first simply leathern bags now they have increased in size and importance of construction to half barrels and so upwards to large iron cylinders which sit easily upon wheels running in the wires as they ascend and descend and bring up their loads half a cart load at each journey as this is going round the entire circle it follows that there are wires starting everywhere from the rim and converging to a centre at the bottom on which the buckets are always scudding through the air they drop down and creep up not altogether noiselessly but with a gentle trembling sound which mixes itself pleasantly with the murmur from the voices below and the wires seem to be the strings of some wonderful harp aerial or perhaps infernal from which the beholder expects that a louder twang will soon be heard the wires are there always of course but by some lights they are hardly visible the mine is seen best in the afternoon and the visitor looking at it should stand with his back to the setting sun but as he so stands and so looks he will hardly be aware that there is a wire at all if his visit be made say on a saturday afternoon when the works are stopped and the mine is mute when the world below is busy there are thirty-five hundred kaffirs at work some small proportion upon the reef which has to be got into order so that it shall neither tumble in nor impede the work nor overlay the diamondiferous soil as it still does in some places but by far the greater number are employed in digging their task is to pick up the earth and shovel it into the buckets and iron receptacles much of it is loosened for them by blasting which is done after the kaffirs have left the mine at six o'clock you look down and see the swarm of black ants busy at every hole and corner with their picks moving and shoveling the loose blue soil but the most peculiar phase of the mine as you gaze into its large pit is the subdivision into claims and portions could a person see the site without having heard any word of explanation it would be impossible i think to conceive the meaning of all those straight-cut narrow dikes of those mud walls at right angles to each other of those square separate pits and again of those square upstanding blocks looking like houses without doors or windows you can see that nothing on earth was ever less level than the bottom of the bowl and that the black ants in traversing it as they are always doing go up and down almost at every step jumping here on to a narrow wall and skipping there across a deep dividing channel as though some diabolically ingenious architect had contrived a house with five hundred rooms not one of which should be on the same floor and to and from none of which should there be a pair of stairs or a door or a window in addition to this it must be imagined that the architect had omitted the roof in order that the wires of the harp above described might be brought into every chamber the house has then been furnished with picks shovels planks and a few barrels populated with its black legions and there it is for you to look at at first the bottom of the bowl seems small you know the size of it as you look and that it is nine acres enough to make a moderate field but it looks like no more than a bowl gradually it becomes enormously large as your eye dwells for a while on the energetic business going on in one part and then travels away over an infinity of subdivided claims to the work in some other portion it seems at last to be growing under you and that soon there will be no limit to the variety of partitions on which you have to look you will of course be anxious to descend and if you be no better than a man there is nothing to prevent you should you be a lady i would advise you to stay where you are the work of going up and down is hard everything is dirty and the place below is not nearly so interesting as it is above one firm at the mine messrs baring gould atkins and company have gone to the expense of sinking a perpendicular shaft with a tunnel below from the shaft to the mine so as to avoid the use of the aerial tramway and by mr gould's kindness i descended through his shaft nevertheless there was some trouble getting into the mine and when i was there the labour in clambering about from one chamber to another in that marvellously broken house was considerable and was not lessened by the fact that the heat of the sun was about one hundred and forty degrees the division of the claims however became apparent to me and i could see how one was being worked and another left without any present digging till the claim owner's convenience should be suited 
but there is a regulation compelling a man to work if the standing of his blue should become either prejudicial or dangerous to his neighbors there is one shaft that belonging to the firm i have mentioned and one tramway has been cut down by another firm through the reef and circumjacent soil so as to make an inclined plane up and down to the mine the ground was originally divided into eight hundred and one claims with some few double numbers to claims at the east end of the mine but in truth nearly half of those have never been of value consisting entirely of reef the diamondiferous matter the extent of which has now been ascertained not having travelled so far there are in truth four hundred and eight existing claims but there are subdivisions in regard to property very much more minute there are shares held by individuals as small as one sixteenth of a claim the total property is in fact divided into five hundred and fourteen portions the amount of which of course varies extremely every master miner pays ten shillings a month to the government for the privilege of working whether he owns a claim or only a portion of a claim in working this the number of men employed differs very much from time to time when i was there the mine was very full and there were probably almost four thousand men in it and as many more employed above on the stuff when the blue has come up and has been deposited in the great wooden boxes at the top it is then lowered by its own weight into carts and carried off to the ground of the proprietor every diamond digger is obliged to have a space of ground somewhere round the town as near his whim as he can get it to which his stuff is carted and then laid out to crumble and decompose this may occupy weeks but the time depends on what may be the fall of rain if there be no rain it must be watered at a very considerable expense it is then brought to the washing and is first put into a round puddling trough where it is broken up and converted into mud by stationary rakes which work upon the stuff as the trough goes round the stones of course fall to the bottom and as diamonds are the heaviest of stones they fall with the others the mud is examined and thrown away and then the stones are washed and rewashed and sifted and examined the greater number of diamonds are found during this operation but the large gems and those therefore of by far the greatest value are generally discovered while the stuff is being knocked about and put into buckets in the mine it need hardly be said that in such an operation as i have described the greatest care is necessary to prevent stealing and that no care will prevent it the kaffirs are the great thieves to such an extent of super excellence that white superintendence is spoken of as being the only safeguard the honesty of the white man may perhaps be indifferent but such as it is it has to be used at every point to prevent as far as it may be prevented the systematized stealing in which the kaffirs take an individual and national pride the kaffirs are not only most willing but most astute thieves feeling a glory in their theft and thinking that every stone stolen from a white man is a duty done to their chief and their tribe i think it may be taken as certain that no kaffir would feel the slightest pang of conscience at stealing a diamond or that any disgrace would be held to attach to him among other kaffirs for such a performance they come to the fields instructed by their chiefs to steal diamonds and they obey the orders like loyal subjects many of the kaffir chiefs are said to have large quantities of diamonds which have been brought to them by their men returning from the diggings but most of those which are stolen no doubt find their way into the hands of illicit dealers i have been told that the thefts perpetrated by the kaffirs amount to twenty five per cent on the total amount found but this i do not believe the opportunities for stealing are of hourly occurrence and are of such a nature as to make prevention impossible these men are sharp-sighted as birds and know and see a diamond much quicker than a white man they will pick up stones with their toes and secrete them even under the eyes of those who are watching them i was told that a man will so hide a diamond in his mouth and that no examination will force him to disclose it they are punished when discovered with lashes and imprisonment in accordance with the law on the matter no employer is now allowed to flog his man at his own pleasure and the white men who buy diamonds from kaffirs are also punished when convicted by fine and imprisonment for the simple offence of buying from a kaffir but with flogging also if convicted of having instigated a kaffir to steal nevertheless a lucrative business of this nature is carried on 
and the kaffirs know well where to dispose of their plunder though of course but for a small proportion of its value ten shillings a week and their food were the regular wages here as well as elsewhere this i found to be very fluctuating but the money paid had rarely gone lower for any considerable number of men than the above-named rate the lowest amount paid has been seven shillings sixpence a week sometimes it had been as high as twenty shillings and even thirty shillings a week a good deal of the work is supplied by contract certain middlemen undertaking to provide men with all expenses paid at one pound a week when mealies have become dear from drought there being no grass for oxen on the route no money can be made in this way such was the case when i was in Greekland west it is stated by mr oates an engineer in his evidence given to the committee on the Greekland west annexation bill in june eighteen seventy seven that the annual amount of wages paid at kimberley had varied from six hundred thousand pounds to one million six hundred thousand pounds a year nearly the whole of this had gone into the hands of the kaffirs perhaps the most interesting sight at the mine is the escaping of the men from their labor at six o'clock then at the sound of some welcome gong they began to swarm up the sides close at each other's heels apparently altogether indifferent as to whether there be a path or no they come as flies come up a wall only capering as flies never caper and shouting as they come in endless strings as ants follow each other they move passing a long ways which seem to offer no hold to a human foot then it is that one can best observe their costume in which a pair of trousers rarely forms a portion a soldier's red jacket or a soldier's blue jacket has more charms than any other vestment they seem always to be good-humoured always well behaved but then they are always thieves and yet how grand a thing it is that so large a number of these men should have been brought in so short a space of time to the habit of receiving wages and to the capacity of bargaining as to the wages for which they will work i shall not however think it so grand a thing if any one addresses them as the free and independent electors of kimberley before they have got trousers to cover their nakedness i must add also that a visitor to kimberley should if possible take an opportunity of looking down upon the mine by moonlight it is a weird and wonderful sight and may almost be called sublime in its peculiar strangeness end of section seventy nine this recording is in the public domain Section 80 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 80. A Modern Battlefield. About 1898 by julian ralph the picture of our battles which are produced in illustrated papers are not at all like real scenes at the front art cannot keep pace with the quick advances of science and illustrators find that for effect they must still put as much smoke and confusion in their battle studies as when with the old pictures of waterloo if this were left out the public would be disappointed and unable to tell a battlefield from a parade lately a picture in one of our leading papers by a very capable artist showed the british storming a boer position in the middle distance was a boer battery and the only gunner left alive was standing up with a bandage round his head while the smoke and flame and flying fragments of shells filled the air in his vicinity in the rush of the instant he must have been bandaged by the same shot that struck him and as for the smoke and flying debris there was more of these in a corner of that picture than was to be seen in all of the four battles we have fought what then is a modern battle how does it look and sound really the field of operations is so extensive and the range of modern guns is so great that fighting conditions have altered until there is no longer any general noise of battle hurtled in the air no possibility of grasping or viewing an engagement from any single point you may hear one of our big guns lose three miles over on the right and another two miles on the left if you are near they make a tremendous noise yet i have not heard any explosion so loud as a good 
strong clap of thunder. The guns of the enemy cough far in front of you, and their shells burst within your lines with a louder sound, but with no real crash or deafening roar. Our guns at their muzzles create but little smoke, though our Leadite shells throw up clouds of dust and smoke where they fall miles away. Because the Boers are using old-fashioned powder in the cannon, there is a small white cloud wherever one is fired, and a spurt of red sand where their shells dig into the welt. The smoke of war, therefore, and the so-called roar of battle are nowadays occasional, scattered inconsiderable. Rifle firing has been the principal feature of our fights. It sounds like the frying of fat or like the crackling and snapping of green wood in a bonfire. If you are within two miles of the front, you are apt to be under fire, and then you hear the music of individual bullets. Their song is like the magnified note of a mosquito. Zzz, they go over your head. Zzz, they finish as they bury themselves in the ground. This is a sound only to be heard when the bullets fly very close. You pick up your heels and run a hundred or even fifty yards, and you hear nothing but the general crackle of rifle fire in and before the trenches. The put-put or wicker grundle felt gun is able to interest you at a distance of three miles. Its explosions are best described by the nickname given to the gun by our regiment, the Blooming Dough Knocker. Its bullets or shells are as big as the bowel of a large briar rope pipe, and they tear and slit the air with a terrible sound, exploding when they strike. The firing of this gun was heard all over the largest of our battlefields, and the sound of exploding shells carried far, because they were apt to fall on the quiet outer edge of the field. The whiz that even these missiles make in flying, however, is like the whispered answers of a maid in love, only to be heard by the favored individual who is especially addressed. Thus the many separate sounds are not loud enough to blend. The crowning all-pervading noises are those of the guns and of the rifle fire and on the vast welt spread over a double line of five to seven miles in length, only those that are very near are very loud. The scene of battle, the general view, is exceedingly orderly. There may be a desperate scrimmage where a company or two are storming a cup jay, but level your glass on yonder hill, and what do you see? A fringe of tiny jets of fire from the top where the bowers are, and our men in khaki rising and declining, and occasionally firing as they win their way upward. The general view displays an arrangement as methodical as a chessboard. There are several battalions flat on their faces in two or three long lines. Over here is a battery in perfect order with a slimmer of horses addressed nearby. Another battery, equally well arranged as if to have its photograph taken, is to be seen in the middle field. A third is on the farther side. The cavalry is sweeping across the world in perfect rank and alignment. There is no confusion anywhere, nothing is helter-skelter or slapdash. I remember only two momentary disturbances of this stern, steady discipline. One was in the afternoon, during the Mother River fight, when a large band of mounted bowers made a flank movement on our extreme right and fired a volley at our immense mass of transport and ambulance wagons, water carts and ammunition trains. The drivers were taken by surprise and fell to lashing their mule teams and horses generally to the accompaniment of high-keyed kaffir yells. The rout lasted but five minutes or less and was comical beyond description because the leading mules climbed over the wheelers and the faster the bullets fell the louder the kaffirs yelled and the more they plied their enormous whips. The bravery of our stretcher bearer is as much beyond question as it is beyond praise. All historians who tell of the dash and valor of the generals, colonels, majors, captains, and tommies of the army in common justice must also describe how the chaplains, doctors, and stretcher bearers went in and out of the most hellish fire not once or twice but all through every battle. It is just outside the range of fire that you see and realize the horrors of war. 
It is there that the wounded crawl and stagger by you. It is there that they spend their final output of energy and fall down to lie until assistance comes. It is there that you see stretchers laden with their mangled freight and sound soldiers bearing the wounded on their backs and in their arms. More certainly to know the brutality and woe of war happen upon a cup J that has just been stormed or a trench that has been carried. Go to such a place today, twenty centuries after Christ came with his message of peace on the earth and good will to men, and behold what you shall see. Here, said I to the photographer in such a place, I think it was Belmont. Stop the scene, look at the wounded all over the ground, quick, out with your camera. Oh, I can't, said he, it's too horrible. As you please, I said, but it's what the public wants. You read in the writings of those who know nothing of war about the writhing of the wounded and the groaning on the battlefield. There is no writhing and the groans are few and faint. There was one man who was simply cut to pieces by a shell at Magerfontein, and his sufferings must have been awful. He kept crying, Doctor, can you do anything? Another begged to be killed and the first wounded man I saw kept saying, poor fellow in ever so low a voice oh dear 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 oh dear 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 but there is much less groaning than you would imagine very little in proportion to the sufferings two things are so common with the wounded as to be almost like rules of behavior they all beg for water it used to be cigarettes that they asked for on the turkish side in the last war in europe and they seem always to be made gentle by their wounds. Men of their roughest speech, profane by second nature, cease to offend when stricken down. Well, mate, said one whose leg was shattered, you never know when your turn will come, do you? And another simply cried, oh dear. Now and then you heard, for God's sake, get me taken to an ambulance. But no profanity was intended there. Many may wonder how it feels to be wounded. All who had bones shattered by expanding bullets used nearly the same language to describe the sensation. You feel, they said, exactly as if you had received a powerful shock from an electric battery. And then comes a blow as if your foot or arm or whatever part it might be was crushed by a stroke with a tremendous mallet. It is much the same in a lesser degree if a bone is struck by a Mossor bullet. But if the smooth, slender, clean little shot merely pierces the flesh, a burning or stinging sensation is the instantaneous result. Lying six hours in the broiling sun was pretty bad, said one whose arm bone was smashed. But the really awful experience was the jolting over rocks when I was carried off in an ambulance. Another man, an officer, whose foot was smashed by an explosive bullet, said, Look at my pipe. That's what I did to keep from saying anything. He had bitten off an inch of the hardened rubber mouthpiece. That was before his wound was dressed. The relief that is given by the dressing of a wound must be exquisite, for you hear next to no groans or moans after a doctor has given this first attention. In the army of Lord Methuen, the great majority of wounds were in the arms and feet and by other points and experiences in war are more remarkable. The chances of receiving a wound seem not to have greatly increased with the improvements in modern death-dealing implements. There were more than a million shots fired at Mother River, and yet only about 800 men were hit, while the number of bullets that hit water bottles, haversacks, ration tins, and coat sleeves was astonishing, the damage to life and limb by the excessive artillery fire was next to nothing. On a typical field of battle, the armies oppose one another with orderly masses. Staff officers ride hither and thither. Batteries rumble to and fro at long intervals as they are ordered to take new positions, and in the same way the cavalry appear and reappear on the edges of the field. Stretcher bearers bring the wounded out of the zone of danger, and ambulances roll up, get their loads, and roll away again, all day continually as in ceaseless train. Brave privates bring out the wounded and work their way back into fire again, now running forward, now dropping flat upon the veldt. 
Skulkers work back to the edge of the field in the same way, a few only, and are gathered up and sent forward in batches by the officers who come upon them. At last the cheer of British victory is heard, and the whole force rushes forward, or darkness falls upon an unfinished fight, and we grope about the vaults, seeking our camps and the food and drink that most of us have gone without too long. End of section 80 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fano Jahangir. Section 81 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eighty one in the south african army nineteen o three to nineteen o four by gustav frensen from the general scramble of the powers for territory in africa germany emerged with an extensive tract in the southwest she has made vigorous efforts to develop it as a colony spending much blood and money in her attempts to subdue the natives and turn the country into a promising field for german emigration this story is from a book supposed to be written by a soldier in the german army telling of his experiences in the campaign against the natives in nineteen o three to nineteen o four the editor we were to surround the enemy in an arc to the north and corner them just as one runs in a circle and corners a colt so that it runs back where the boy is waiting with a halter in his hand we were to make forced marches with fewer and lighter wagons which meant smaller and lighter rations and with less and lighter clothing we were about three hundred men marines sailors and the home guards who were leading us the troop of old africans again went on ahead officers and common soldiers all mounted then came the old major with one officer then we foot soldiers in a long thin line veiled in dust here and there in our line were the thirty great cape wagons loaded with the light field pieces and each drawn by from ten to twenty-four long-horned oxen which were driven with much shouting by negroes on both sides of the way was more or less dense grayish green thorn bush the wood of which is as hard as bone and which grows to the height of a man and sometimes twice that height and has curved thorns as long as one's finger in such wise and through such country we now travel day after day and week after week and day by day and week by week our progress became more painful for soon came the time when we began to suffer from hunger and want when the oxen began to fall from exhaustion and when some of the clumsily rumbling wagons were full of the distress of the wounded or very sick when the sun mounted high over us almost to the zenith and the sand was scorching and eyes and throats were burning the van would halt at a clearing where there ought to have been water but the water was not always there then suffering terribly from thirst we had to dig holes to see if we could find a little water slowly filtering through often it was salt or milky from lime or smelled vile and oftener we didn't find even this miserable loathsome water and we had to go on again thirsty far into the night if we did find water we would make a barricade of thorn bush around us then each mess division would get its meagre supply of food a little meat from a freshly killed ox which had fallen exhausted a little flour and a little rice the meat or flour we stirred up in a kettle with the bad water and set it over the fire 
calling it meat soup or bouillon with rice or pancakes which they called plinson the cooking utensils were cleaned with sand after that we lay for an hour in the shade of the wagons or of a canvas that had been set up and then started on again weary and indifferent we marched on till evening and often into the night and i don't know that in those weeks we ever sang the moonlight lay wonderfully pale like bright spider webs over the broad bushy land and the unfamiliar stars gleamed strangely confused and restless the gun straps pressed on our shoulders our feet stumbled in the uneven track and our thoughts were slow and dull when we had reached water in the night and had had dealt out to us one or two or if it was more plenty even three cook-pan covers full of the miserable stuff we were too tired to cook properly we stirred up together a little of whatever we got and ate it half cooked we had orders to bring the water to the boiling point before we took it but i have seen the officers and for that matter even the physicians themselves drink it just as it was we were too tired and apathetic so it went on every day for four weeks the country was always flat and bushy we didn't see a single house and we didn't meet a human being it was bad that we couldn't take provisions enough with us if we had been able to many more would have seen their homes again we didn't notice it ourselves but the doctors and officers probably saw that we were gradually getting flabby and weak if we had even had time and inclination to cook properly it would have been better but the water was often so repulsive that it was no pleasure and we had to use it so sparingly that our utensils got foul i rubbed them with sand and i rubbed them with grass but they did not get clean and it was bad that we had only thin khaki uniforms in the morning we marched up to our knees in wet grass at noon in hot sand and all day through thorny brush so that the lower part of our trousers fringed out and soon hung in shreds when as sometimes happened a thunderstorm or a shower came up and then night came on we were horribly cold there were some very cold nights thus it had to come about that we soon became very weak even though we did not notice it ourselves i used to think sometimes with surprise there was so much talk and squabbling among us on shipboard and so many jokes among us where are they and why don't we sing how pale and yellow and thin barons has grown how sunken and feverish our under officers eyes look what awfully thin beards we young men have there were many among us not yet twenty once we came upon a great covered wagon left deserted on the road a farmer or a trader had wanted to escape and had packed his most valuable possessions in the wagon harnessed his oxen to it and driven the rest of his flocks before it he had come as far as this his bones lay eaten by beasts his goods were stolen and round about the wagon were strewn the only things which the enemy couldn't use his letters and books we buried the bones in the bush tied a cross together with string and set it on the grave and took some letters and remnants of books read them and threw them away another day we discovered hidden in the bush on a hill by the way many deserted huts of the enemy they were like great beehives made of a skeleton of branches and twigs plastered over with cow dung although we were so tired we took the time to set fire to these and afterwards stood on a rise in our road and looked back the glow dyed the evening sky for a great distance besides this i don't know that anything special happened to us we marched continually along the sandy road in a cloud of dust on both sides of us brush that from time to time was thinner or that yielded to make a majestic clearing 
our horsemen the old africans and the officers rode often an hour in advance of us and tried to spy out the enemy when they came back the news would often spread through the ranks or at night from fire to fire we are close to the enemy now to-morrow or the day after we shall meet them then we rejoiced and each man sat and looked over his gun and examined his cartridge belt but a new day came and still another and we grew weaker and more exhausted and we saw nothing of the enemy so it went on for four weeks further and further it was bad that we never had our clothes off and could never wash ourselves and seldom and then not thoroughly even our faces and hands but what was worse we could never get enough to eat any more they had given to me the task of getting the rations for our mess i brought less and less to the cooking hole a little rice a little flour a little canned meat and a little coffee there was no more sugar and one day i came back from the wagon with no salt then i baked pancakes made of dirty water and flour the water we drank with our food tasted disgustingly of glauber salts often it was as yellow as pea soup and smelled vile the nights were cold i cannot say that we were cast down we didn't grumble either we perceived that it couldn't go any other way and that the officers endured all that we did we were very quiet and sober though we held ourselves together with the thought we shall soon now come upon the enemy and beat them and finish up the campaign and then oh then we shall go back to the capital and get new clothes and have a bath we'll spring into the water and we'll get a new handkerchief a really clean red checked one and a great lot of good meat and a handful of white salt and a great great mug of clean crystal clear water how it will glisten and we'll have a long long drink and hold out the empty mug and again the water will pour into it and we'll drink and drink and then after a few days we'll travel back to the coast and we'll start for home what shan't we have to tell about this monkey land our boots fell apart our trousers were nothing but shreds and rags at the bottom our jackets got full of great holes from the thorns and were horribly greasy because we wiped everything off on them our hands were full of inflamed places because we often had to seize the thorns with them our lieutenant often talked to us keep up your courage he would say we shall have a fight and throw the rascals back to the west into the jaws of the main division and in july we'll be at home again i marvelled at him that he though not much older than we and suffering all the hardships that we did was always uniformly calm while we were often good for nothing and got angry and grumbled it wasn't because he had learned more than we i think it came from the fact that he was at heart a cultivated man that is he had his soul and mind in control so that he could value justly and could make allowance for the things about him his will would have it so and it came to pass and i've noticed that will-power is worth ten times more than mere knowing we never said a word of how much we thought of him and watched him he was a small man and rode a strong east prussian horse and always wore his felt hat a little over the left ear with the brim tilted up on the left side the old major came sometimes and addressed us while doing so he looked at each man as closely as though he wanted to find out if he were having any sort of trouble we all felt that he was a wise and wide-awake man and that he had a gentle sympathetic heart we felt therefore safe under him and we knew it could not be any different from what it was or he would have changed it and we would run like so many rabbits if we could do any little service for him when any one had run that way we used to jeer at him and say are you trying to burst yourself man but when the turn came to any one else he would run just the same sometimes when we were all sitting about our fire-holes i would take myself off over to the old africans who always had their fire by one of the wagons which sergeant hansen conducted 
then hansen would motion to me for he liked me since i had talked to him in the courtyard of the fort they always sat by themselves not entirely out of pride but also because they were mostly from five to twenty years older than we were some of them had been already ten years or more in the country i used to sit down quietly with them and listen with great eagerness to their talk sometimes they talked of the wild fifteen years struggles in the colony in all or part of which they had shared and of the fighting in the last three months they recalled the scene of many a brave deed and named many a valiant man dead or living i was surprised that so many hard undertakings of which i had never heard or read so much as a word had been carried through by germans and that already so much german blood had been lavishly spilled in this hot barren land they touched too upon the causes of the uprising and one of the older men who had been long in the country said children how should it be otherwise they were ranchmen and proprietors and we were there to make them landless working men and they rose up in revolt they acted in just the same way that north germany did in eighteen thirteen this is their struggle for independence but the cruelty said some one else and the first speaker replied indifferently do you suppose that if our whole people should rise in revolt against foreign oppressors it would take place without cruelty and are we not cruel toward them they discussed too what the germans really wanted here they thought we ought to make that point clear the matter stood this way there were missionaries here who said you are our dear brothers in the lord and we want to bring you these benefits namely faith love and hope and there were soldiers farmers and traders and they said we want to take your cattle and your land gradually away from you and make you slaves without legal rights those two things didn't go side by side it is a ridiculous and crazy project either it is right to colonize that is to deprive others of their rights to rob and to make slaves or it is just and right to christianize that is to proclaim and live up to brotherly love one must clearly desire the one and despise the other one must wish to rule or to love to be for or against jesus the missionaries used to preach to them ye are our brothers and that turned their heads they are not our brothers but our slaves whom we must treat humanely but strictly these ought to be our brothers they may become that after a century or two they must first learn what we ourselves have discovered to stem water and to make wells to dig and to plant corn to build houses and to weave clothing after that they may well become our brothers one doesn't take any one into a partnership till he has paid up his share one old freight carrier who mixed many english and dutch words in his speech said it would be better if the colony were sold to the english the germans are probably useful as soldiers and farmers he said but they understand nothing about the government of colonies they want this and they want that a younger man who had been in the country only three years said in answer there'll have to be a thousand or two german graves in this country before that happens and perhaps they'll be dug this year over these conversations it got to be late at night the fires still glowed a little and in the uncertain light i saw the faces that had become browned and weather-beaten from the burning of the african sun in these hard hot days of marching and cold moonlight nights when we were advancing painfully but still not without courage one week after another through the wild bushy land there was not a house not a ditch not a tree not a boundary in the burning sun by day or the pale moonlight of the clear nights when i was plodding along hungry and dirty and weary by the sandy uneven wagon track my gun on my shoulder when i lay in the noon hour in the shadow of the great cape wagons and in the bitter cold nights hungry and restless in a thin blanket on the bare earth 
and the strange stars shone in the beautiful blue heavens then i believe even then in those painful weeks i learned to love that wonderful endless country end of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain section eighty two of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eighty two advancing upon the enemy nineteen o three to nineteen o four by gustav frensen before midnight we advanced toward the enemy it was said that our division would come upon them about morning the wit boys rode on ahead as spies then came our company one part was detached to ride at the side of the road in the bush the other part was to keep on riding in the road i was in the third platoon behind me in compact array came the artillery we marched as quietly as possible but still there were all sorts of noises snorting of horses jolting of wheels an impatient angry shout or a blow with a whip i was very cold in the saddle and in order not to have stiff fingers later when i had to shoot i laid the reins over my cartridge belt and put my hands in my pockets at last morning broke and delicate rosy stripes of light soon shot up toward the zenith the colors grew rapidly deeper brighter and stronger the red was glorious in its fullness and the blue beautiful in its purity the light mounted and extended itself ascending like a new world a thousand times more beautiful than the old one then came the sun big and clear looking like a great placid wide open eye although like a good soldier i had all my thoughts fixed on what was before me on the enemy and the bad hours i should probably meet with yet i saw the splendour of the sky near me rode a fellow from hamburg a fresh quiet boy he said once to me you see one has to have experienced something or how shall one become a serious capable man that's why i came here he was to enter his father's business later he was writing just as i was his reins over his cartridge belt and his hands in his pockets he was frowning this morning and kept a sharp lookout before him diagonally behind me rode the former officer about this time of day according to the predictions of our scouts we ought to reach the enemy but they were not to be seen then i thought as did many others that again there would be no fighting and i was annoyed shortly after this however we heard the thunder of cannon coming from our right it got to be eight o'clock and nine the bush was so dense that the party sent into it could not advance they came out and marched together along the road the sun was steadily mounting it was getting to be a hot day it began to be warm riding and the horses were growing tired a little thin lieutenant with a drawn face and sharp eyes rode up alongside of me and said in a suppressed voice we aren't a mile and a half from the water holes several times in the last few days he had made dangerous excursions into this region and he knew every bush then the first shot fell ahead with a quick swing we were out of our saddles and had thrown the reins over our horses necks those who were to hold the horses seized them our company was only ninety strong and as we left ten with the horses only eighty men went into the thick bush the enemy were firing vigorously and letting out short wild cries i saw one of our men wounded he stooped and examined a wound in his leg still i saw nothing of the enemy 
then just for a second i saw a piece of an arm in a grayish brown cord coat and i shot at it then i lay down to spy out another target lively firing was being exchanged when one of us thought he had hit his mark he would announce it with a loud voice that one won't get up again i got him in the middle of the breast the third man at my right who was lying by a bush in front of me twitched convulsively a derisive voice on the other side shouted had enough dutchman my comrade said in a quiet voice i have a bullet in my shoulder and he crawled back on all fours i could hear through all our own shooting that we were getting fired upon from the left this fire now became heavier they were coming nearer in close ranks they came creeping and shouting and screaming two of my neighbors were not shouting any more we crawled back once or twice our length the enemy shouted look out dutchman look out and laughed wildly others shouted hurrah hurrah the bush was swarming with men i thought they would now break loose upon us in a wild storm and that it would be all up with us on account of our wounded men i was fearfully anxious lest we should have to retreat i was firmly resolved if the command should come to shout loudly take along the wounded but when i had just decided on this plan a subordinate officer came up with several men and cheered us on with the words hold your position i am sending aid soon afterwards i heard something slipping and grating behind me and a quiet soft voice said move a little to the side the nozzle of a machine-gun was pushed forward near my face and immediately began to crackle away the grape shot hissed furiously into the bushes rattling and whizzing how good it sounded how surely and quietly i shot did i hit did you see shoot man there there cannon too upon a slope behind us were now thundering over our heads then it grew a little more quiet on the other side and the command of forward double quick reached us we sprang up and plunged forward but a horrible volley of grape shot was poured against us and threw us back again in front of me an under officer had got a ball in the body and blood was streaming from the wound he was crouching and trying to stem the flow of blood with a handkerchief and was calling for help he was a light-complexioned fine-looking man just then the former officer the one who was under the official ban came up from the side seized the wounded man by the shoulders and dragged him back while balls were falling around him and the barrel of his gun was hit so that it flew rattling to one side he then quietly lay down in his place again on the other side in the bush they were shouting in wild zeal and shrieking for very rage we did not advance i don't know how long we lay there firing it was probably hours i wondered once why no officer was to be seen with us and i forgot it again sweat ran like water over my entire body not merely my tongue but my throat my whole body cried out for a swallow of cool water at one side a hospital aide was trying to bind a rubber bandage around the bleeding leg of a wounded man who begged him in south german dialect take me back a little can you then the aide dragged him back panting the fire from the other side was getting weaker a voice commanded us fire more slowly from the other side we heard it jeeringly mimicked fire more slowly a wounded man cried aloud for water we lay and waited our guns pointed word passed from mouth to mouth the captain is dead the first lieutenant too all the officers and almost all the under officers propping my gun in position i took my field flask with my left hand and swallowed the little draught i had saved up for the greatest emergency as i set the flask aside i thought that perhaps it would be my last drink and i thought of my parents i believed that the enemy would get breath and then make another assault but that did not happen a lieutenant who belonged to the staff came stooping along our ranks when he was behind me he knelt there touched my boot lightly and said go to the general and report that according to my reckoning we are about a half a mile distant from the last water-holes i got cautiously up on my knees and then ducking down ran back to the road 
near an ant-hill which was certainly three yards high a surgeon and a hospital aide were endeavouring to save a man from bleeding to death but i believe they came too late for he lay like dead on his dark red blanket then i saw the balloon not far in front of me and i ran across the clearing to it the long rows of oxen standing in harness in front of their wagons raised their open mouths and bellowed hoarsely for they scented the water-holes and panted for water the soldiers at the wagons and horses called to me with dry voices get ahead you fellows up forward are we coming to water soon are we going on they looked at me with deep dry eyes those who held the horses had a great deal of trouble with the thirsty creatures which were standing crowded together swarmed over and tortured by insects the sun scorched down a thick horribly dry dust-filled air lay over the whole camp the surgeons in white cloaks stood in front of the hospital wagon around a table on which some one was lying i wondered how many were lying in the shade of the wagon five or six of them were dead among them our captain a wounded officer i think it was a lieutenant was giving water with his well hand to the severely wounded his other arm was bleeding badly at the general's wagon a man was standing by the heliograph the general was near by with officers and orderlies around him all of them on foot i reported and heard some one say the animals can't hold out any longer and the men are simply dying of thirst the next moment just as i had turned to run to the front there came from behind from two or three directions wild shouting and volleys from the bush the outposts who were lying and kneeling on the ground all around moved in immediately the voice of an officer rang out sharp and clear disperse and charge in knots i ran and saw as i ran that a hailstorm of bullets was riddling the hospital wagon that the doctors were seizing their guns and that one of them was wounded i even heard one say we'll take off our white cloaks though then i lay down by a bush and shot at the enemy who with wild shouts continued their onset through the bushes secretaries orderlies drivers guard and officers all rushed forward lay down near one another and protected their skins the artillery turned while firing and shot away over us excited by my run and the sudden attack i began a violent rapid fire a voice near me said shoot more calmly i did fire more calmly thinking who said that and as i seized my cartridge belt and looked to the side there lay the general two men from me shooting coolly as becomes an old soldier the enemy were pressing on in close ranks through the bush shouting and firing but we lay quietly and shot well then it got more quiet the officers stood up and returned to the centre of the camp again immediately after that came the order that the whole camp should advance two hundred yards in running by i saw them lifting the dead and wounded into wagons then i ran forward again to my place in the line of defence now as i lay there i felt how very parched i was begging and complaining and teasing for water went through the ranks from behind we heard the hoarse lowing of the thirsty oxen i believe that at this time four in the afternoon there was not a drop of water in the whole camp except for the wounded then everything was moved to the front soldiers artillery and machine-guns a terrific fire rattled against the enemy who were growing weary then word passed from man to man we are going to charge now the battle cry told i shall never forget it with fierce yells with distorted faces with dry and burning eyes we sprang to our feet and hurled ourselves forward the enemy leaped fired and dispersed with loud outcries we ran without interference shouting cursing and shooting to the good-sized clearing where the ardently desired water-holes were and across it to the farther edge where the bush began again the entire camp the heavy wagons with their long teams of oxen the hundreds of horses the hospital wagons with the surgeons the dead and the wounded the headquarters everything followed in a rush and encamped in the clearing but we lay around it at the edge of the bush to keep back the enemy who now here and now there would break through the thick bushes in wild loudly shouting parties behind us our men were now climbing down with army kettles into the water-holes which were ten yards deep and were filling buckets let down on reins and were beginning to water man and beast when about ten animals had had a little the hole was empty there were about ten or twelve holes at this place the sun went down some of us slipped out cut brush with our side arms 
and made a stockade in front of us the artillerymen set up the cannon and machine-guns behind us and knelt near them some of the soldiers were detailed to creep from man to man and give each a little water in the camp further back of us the restlessly crowding animals were being watered in the dark by the hospital wagons nurses were going about lanterns in their hands bending over each patient meanwhile the enemy kept up their firing which continually flashed out of the dark bush all around the camp not until about midnight did it become more quiet we passed a little zwieback from hand to hand then complete darkness settled upon us and the shooting at last ceased what plan had the enemy in mind here we lay in the dark night four hundred men worn out and half dead with thirst and in front of us and all around us a savage furious people numbering sixty thousand we knew and heard nothing of the other german divisions perhaps they had been slaughtered and the sixty thousand were now collecting themselves to fall upon us through the quiet night we heard in the distance the lowing of enormous herds of thirsty cattle and a dull confused sound like the movement of a whole people to the east there was a gigantic glow of fire i lay stretched at full length with my gun ready and cheered my utterly exhausted comrades to keep awake thus morning gradually came on then some scouts went out cautiously and we learned to our great amazement that the enemy had withdrawn and indeed in wild flight we should have liked to follow them up but we had no news yet from the other divisions moreover both men and beasts had reached the limit of their strength so we rested on that day ate a little poor food and cleansed and repaired our guns and other equipment for we looked like people who had battered and bruised and soiled themselves in an attack of frenzy the madness still showed in our frowning brows and in our eyes our dead lay in the midst of us in the shade of a tree we had a great deal of trouble to keep our animals from dying we could not give them anywhere near enough water to satisfy them and we could not give them any fodder at all because the entire region had been eaten as bare by the enemy's cattle as if rats and mice had gnawed it clean the men and the animals had even grubbed into the earth in search of roots it was a miserable day the sun glared down and an odour of old manure filled the whole land to suffocation at noon there came at last some news from the other divisions two reported that they had beaten the enemy the third that it had saved itself with great difficulty and distress the enemy had fled to the east with their whole enormous mass women children and herds toward evening we buried our dead under the tree end of section eighty two this recording is in the public domain section eighty three of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org arabia part one early history historical note little is known of the early history of arabia save that it was the home of many tribes some with fixed abodes but most of them wandering about as the mood seized them or some fancied advantage occurred to them they had no permanent government no laws and no settled religion some worshipped the stars some angels or heavenly spirits when they came in contact with a nation they usually borrowed some of its religious customs they made images of their various deities and paid them great reverence persecuted christians sometimes fled to arabia and by the end of the sixth century a vague and inaccurate knowledge of christianity had spread through much of the country in the early part of the seventh century mohammed began to teach and before many years he had gained a large number of followers there is but one god and mohammed is his prophet was the main tenet of his preaching the arabs accepted his faith and this brought about their union not only in religion but also in government after the death of mohammed his followers pressed on in their warfare and by preaching and fighting they overran syria and persia and central asia their faith was adopted by the turks egypt and northern africa yielded to their arms they conquered spain so completely that in the greater part of the country the customs dress and language as well as religion became that of arabia europe seemed about to fall into their hands but in seven thirty two exactly a century after the death of mohammed the Mohammedans were met at Tours by Charles Martel and were overcome. 
Had the invaders been the victors, no one can estimate the length of time that the civilization of Europe would have been retarded. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 84. The Legend of the Arabs by Alfonso Mary Luido Lamartine. Tradition says that Nimrod, the fabulous king of Babylon, heard a prophecy that a child should be born who would become greater than himself and all the rest of mankind. To prevent this, he forbade marriage. Nevertheless, the father of Abraham took to himself a wife. When the child was born, his parents, in order to save his life, hid him in a cave outside the city, and thither the angels came and cared for him editor abraham nursed by the angels grew in strength and intellect in his cavern his first aggression from it was by night the firmament of chaldea filled with luminous creatures that floated in the ether revealed to him god only he was not yet able to distinguish him from his works a star resplendent beyond the others first arrested his dazzled eyes there is my god exclaimed he to himself Presently the star descended and disappeared in the horizon. No, said he, that cannot be the god whom I adore. So with several other constellations. Afterwards the moon arose. There is my god, cried he, and it said, No, it is not my god. In fine, the sun rose majestically in the east, at the border of the forest. Here truly is my god, said he. It is large and dazzling beyond all others. The sun accomplished his career and went down in the horizon, leaving the mantle of night upon the earth. That is not a still the god I look for to adore, muttered pensively the infant destined for the adoration of the divinity invisible, immovable and eternal. He returned to his cavern to seek his god in his own soul. Having left at length his cave and been presented to Nimrod as a young man born long before the interdiction of the marriages, Abraham began revealing to the Babylonians the immaterial god, exhorting them to worship in spirit and in truth, and to eject the idols from the temples. The priests of Babylon led the profaner of the idols before Nimrod to have him punished. Who then is your god? demanded the king of the young prophets. My God, said Abraham, is he who giveth life and death. It is I who give life and death, rejoined Nimrod. To prove it, he ordered into his presence from the prisons of Babylon two criminals condemned to death and who were awaiting execution. He cut off the head of one, he gave pardon to the other, and supposed his interlocutor confounded. But Abraham, at first perplexed how to refute this sophism in action, soon recovered himself and offered the king a challenge of omnipotence. Very well, said he. My God is he who makes the sun to rise in the east. Do you make it rise in the west? Nimrod replied, as embarrassed tyrants do, by fire. He had the youthful prophet thrown into a burning pyre. But the fire became cold says the history abraham retired into the deserts of mesopotamia with his family his slaves and his flocks there commence the hebrews the arabs of the bible and of jerusalem the sons of isaac let us turn to those of the desert and of mecca the sons of ishmael it was upon the future site of this city a site then without inhabitants and without water that abraham in deference to the jealousy of his wife sarah abandoned his slave hagar and the child he had by her ishmael scarce had the unfortunate hagar exhausted the provisions of dates and water which abraham had left her for herself and her son than she felt the torments of thirst and ran desperately through the valleys and parched ravines of safa asking them in vain 
for a single drop of water or the oozing moisture of a rock to wet the lips of her infant. During this absence of his mother, Ishmael cried with impatience and thirst, and striking in his anger with his heel upon the sand, there issued thence a fountain of cool and pure water. Hagar hastened back to the wailings of her son. She saw the water, and fearing lest it should evaporate in the sun or disappear in the sand, she set to kneading the moistened earth in her hands, and shaped it into a basin to retain the treasure. This miraculous water, which flows still at the present day, is the source of the famous wells of Zamzam of Mecca, which have the virtue of sanctifying the drinkers. Some Arab shepherds of a wandering tribe were pasturing their camels on the sides of the Mount Arafat in the neighborhood. They saw some eagles fighting overhead the site where the prodigy had just taken place. Suspecting that the birds had smelt the moisture, they hastened thither. They found the spring, the young mother, and the child. Who are you, and what is this child? asked they of Hagar. Whence comes this water? We have never before seen it during these many years that we traverse these solitudes. Hagar related to them her abandonment. They took compassion on her. The child, for whom the earth seemed to have opened like a mother's breast, appeared to them a being predestined for celestial benedictions. They announced this prodigy to the tribe, who came to dwell upon the spot. Ishmael grew up in the midst of this people. He married one of their daughters named Amara. Abraham made them two visits with the permission of Sarah. Sarah, still jealous, had exacted this condition that Abraham should not dismount from his horse at the lodgings of Hagar. The first time Abraham visited Mecca, he stopped at the door of Ishmael and called him by his name. Amara, the wife of Ishmael, came to the door. Where is Ishmael? inquired the patriarch without dismounting. He is hunting, replied Amara. Have you nothing to give me to eat? For I cannot come down. I have nothing, said Amara. This country is a desert. Very well, rejoined Abraham. Say to your husband that you have seen a stranger. Describe to him my figure and tell him that I recommend him to change the threshold of his door. Amara, on the return of Ishmael, acquitted herself of the message. Her husband, offended that she had refused his father hospitality, repudiated her and married a woman of another tribe named Saida. Abraham returned some time after to visit her son. He was absent. A young, slim, and graceful woman came to the threshold of the door to make reply to the stranger. "'Have you some nourishment to give me?' asked Abraham of his daughter-in-law, without making himself known or dismounting from his horse. "'Yes,' said she in an instant. In going into the house, she returned soon after, presenting to the traveller some cooked venison, milk, and dates. Abraham tasted the edibles, then blessed them in saying, May God multiply in this country these three species of nutriment. After the repast, Seda said to the old man, Dismount from your horse that I may bathe your head and your beard. I cannot, replied the patriarch. I am under oath not to quit the saddle. And merely setting one foot upon a larger stone beside the door while the other leg continued astride on the saddle, he in this way stooped his head within reach of the young woman who laved away the dust wherewith his eyes and beard were soiled when your husband returns said the patriarch on departing describe to him my figure and say to him from me that the threshold of his door is alike beautiful and solid and that he take good care not to change it ishmael upon hearing this recital and these words said to saida he whom you have seen is my father, and he orders me in this wise to keep you carefully forever. In a third visit to his son, Abraham built conjointly with him at Mecca a temple or house of God called Kaaba. This temple, which is still at this day the temple of Mecca, was a small and shapeless structure without window or door or roof constructed of unhewn blocks of stone. Abraham did the mason work, and his son Ishmael quarried the stones. They inserted in one of the walls the famous black stone, which an angel was supposed to have conveyed direct from heaven to sanctify the house of the deity. They instituted pilgrimage rites 
and processions around the edifice which have made subsequently of mecca the religious capital of arabia and which muhammad was obliged to retain with a change of spirit after his reform but be it as it may with these mythological traditions mecca became through the processions of the kaaba the object of the pilgrimage and the center of the superstitions of all the arabs who were not adorers of jehovah and idolatry dethroned the pure worship of abraham and peopled the kaaba with idols end of section eighty four this recording is in the public domain recording by fano jangiri section eighty five of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 85. Mohammed, about 570 to 632. By Eva March Tappan. Mohammed was born in Mecca in Arabia and he became so famous when a man that the people who knew him as a boy came to believe in many wonderful things as having happened to him when he was small it was said that the sheep bowed to him as he passed by and that even the moon stooped from her place in the heavens to do him honour while he was in the house of his nurse so the legend says her well never dried and her pastures were always fresh and green the little boy soon lost both father and mother and was brought up in the house of his uncle he must have been a most lovable boy for every one seems to have been kind to him this uncle held an office of great honour he was guardian of a certain black stone which it was said the angel gabriel had given to abraham the stone was built into the outer wall of the kaaba a little square temple which the arabians looked upon as especially holy most of them were worshippers of idols and the Kaaba was the home of enough idols to provide a different one for every day in the year. Throngs of pilgrims journeyed to Mecca to kiss the stone and worship in the Kaaba, and the boy must have heard marvelous tales of the strange places from which they came. His uncle was a merchant and used to go with caravans to Syria and elsewhere to get goods. When Mohammed was twelve years old, he begged earnestly to be allowed to go with him. The uncle said no then the boy pleaded but my uncle who will take care of me when you are gone the tender-hearted man could not refuse any longer and mohammed went on his first journey after this he always travelled with his uncle and when the uncle went out to help his tribe fight another one he became the uncle's armor-bearer he learned about life in a caravan and about buying and selling goods and while he was hardly more than a boy he was often employed by merchants to go on such trips as their agent at length he was engaged by a wealthy widow named khadija to manage the large business which the death of her husband had left her in charge she became more and more pleased with the young man and after a while she sent a trusty slave to offer him her hand he was surprised but not at all unwilling and soon there was a generous wedding feast with music and dancing the house was open to all who chose to come and a camel was killed that its flesh might be given to the poor mohammed thought much about religious questions he came to believe that his people were wrong in worshipping idols and that there was only one true god he used to go to a cavern a few miles from mecca to pray and meditate one month in every year he gave up entirely to this after a while he began to have strange dreams and visions in one of these he thought the angel gabriel held before him a silken cloth on which there was a golden writing and bade him read it but i do not know how to read replied mohammed read in the name of the most high said the angel and suddenly the power to read the letters came to him and he found the writings were commands of god then the angel declared thou art the prophet of god mohammed told khadija of his vision and she believed that the angel had really come to him after a little he began to preach wherever people would listen a few believed in him but most people only laughed at his story 
still he kept on preaching and after a while although he had but few followers in mecca there were many in medina who had come to believe that he was the prophet of god he decided that it was best for him to go to them and in the year six hundred and twenty two he and a few friends escaped from their enemies in mecca and went to medina this is called the hagira or flight to this day mohammedans do not count the years from the birth of christ but from the hagira as soon as the prophet was in medina his followers began to build a mosque or place for prayer in which he might preach they made the walls of earth and brick the pillars were the trunks of palm trees and the roof was formed of their branches with a thatch of leaves he decided that his disciples should be called to prayer five times a day and after all these centuries the call or muzin is still heard in the east from some minaret of each mosque god is great there is no god but god mohammed is the apostle of god come to prayers come to prayers at dawn the crier adds prayer is better than sleep every true mussulman as followers of mohammed are called is bound to obey this rule of prayer and as he prays he must turn his face toward mecca he is also commanded to make at least one pilgrimage to mecca before he dies and to kiss the sacred black stone it is still in the wall of the kaaba but the kaaba itself is now within a mosque so large that it will hold thirty-five thousand persons it is probable that mohammed never learned to read or write but his followers jotted down his words on bits of palm leaves or skins or even the shoulder blades of animals and many of them they learned by heart after the death of the prophet the caliphs as his successors were called collected these sayings and arranged them in a book called the koran which is the sacred volume of the mussulmans for a long while mohammed preached peace and gentleness and charity and he won many followers then he came to believe that if people would not obey his teachings it was right to make war upon them he marched against mecca with a large army of his disciples and soon captured it after a time either by preaching or by fighting the mohammedans or mussulmans became the rulers of all arabia after the death of their prophet they continued their conquests they overcame syria persia egypt northern africa and spain a little later they swarmed over the pyrenees mountains and pushed on as far north as tours in seven hundred and thirty two just one hundred years after the death of mohammed the mohammedans and the franks met in battle on the plain of tours and after a terrible combat the mohammedans were so completely overwhelmed that they retreated toward spain and never again tried to conquer the land of the franks end of section eighty five this recording is in the public domain Section 86 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America. Reading from the Koran. Painting, page 496. A reading from the Koran by William Carl Gentz. Germany, 1822 to 1890. Good Muslims believe that in the beginning a tablet rested beside the throne of God, and that upon this tablet the Koran was written by rays of light. Portions of its teachings were, according to Mohammedan faith, revealed to Mohammed from time to time. The utmost reverence is always shown to any copy of the book, and no one may even touch it without ceremonial purification. In the teachings of the Koran, there is little that is original it demands belief in one god and in mohammed as his prophet charity and kindness to others are enjoined the good mohammedan must drink no spirituous liquor he must pray five times a day with his face turned toward mecca and at some time in his life he must if possible make a pilgrimage to the holy city the language of the koran is regarded as the purest arabic the picture represents one of the mohammedan priests explaining the sacred book to the little audience who have come together to listen to him in the shade of the old stone portico all wear the flowing robes of the east but have as is the custom removed their shoes on entering the building the palm at the right hand makes a graceful frame for the scene pigeons but little disturbed by the coming of people are fluttering about the shelf of rock 
beside the expounder lies a cat who in perfect confidence in these friendly folk does not trouble herself even to keep a watchful eye upon them she is introduced in memory of the time when mohammed cut off the loose sleeve of his robe rather than disturb a cat who had chosen it as a place for her siesta End of section eighty six this recording is in the public domain section eighty seven of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eighty seven the square house or kaaba by haji khan and wilfred sparoy the square house or kaaba stands almost in the centre of the harem rather nearer to the west than to the east footnote harem here means courtyard of the mosque End of footnote. the ground whereon it lies is accounted holy since it was here that adam after his expulsion from the garden of eden first worshipped his creator a tent being sent down from heaven for the purpose this act of grace on the part of the heavenly host was the compassionate result of a conference over which the archangel gabriel had presided there was substituted for the tent by adam's son seth a structure of clay and stone which was rebuilt at a later period under the superintendence of abraham and ishmael his son so much for the legendary history of the house the task of restoring the sacred edifice in the time of ignorance fell to the lot of the four chief tribes of arabia it was rebuilt by the Quraysh a few years after mohammed's birth and was destroyed by the torrents thirty-five years after its completion then ensued a tribal war each of the clans claiming for itself a complete side of the house which should face its tents till the cause of strife was settled by an agreement among the contending tribes to accept the arbitration of abu amid the chief of the Quraysh. The decision of Abu Amid was that the tribe should abide by the determination of the man who, on the following Friday afternoon, should be the first to leave the mosque. So haphazard an arrangement was bound to appeal to the sportsmanlike instinct of a race that has ever been wont to test the wisdom of its actions by the arbitrament of chance. The warriors sheathed their swords, and when the fateful day arrived, not a single murmur was raised against the man who, being the first to reach the open air, set about planning the building as it now appears this man it is said was mohammed the kaaba which was certainly reconstructed in the year sixteen twenty seven the success of sharifs and sultans adding to its interior decorations is said to have been destroyed and restored twelve times since the death of the prophet in shape the kaaba is an almost solid square having from outside a length of fourteen yards and being eleven yards broad and sixteen yards high from afar it has the look of an immense block of dark-coloured granite the double roof is supported from within by pillars of aloe wood the gateway which fills a considerable portion of the eastern wall is raised about six feet from the ground and measures in height some four yards as far as i could gauge the door itself is made of aloe wood and is covered over with plates of solid silver and studded with heavy silver nails the precious metal was presented to the house in nine hundred and fifty nine of the hegira by the generous sultan soliman inlaid in the eastern end of the southern wall of the kaaba is the famous black stone which might be said to be the centre of the pilgrim's circling aspirations and the pivot of their circumambulations round the sacred precincts another stone marking the sepulchre of ishmael lies at the base of the northern wall and from the roof above there projects a horizontal semicircular rainspout which including the end fixed in the wall is five yards long measures twenty-four inches in width and is made of massive gold the water flows from the lip of the split pipe to the floor of the harem below the tomb of abraham the legendary builder of the temple is situated close by to the east not far from the gate of beni shaibeh the prophet's faithful followers when they say their prayers must turn their faces in the direction of the kaaba no matter where they may be this ascertaining of the exact position of the house of god which is the centre of the holy city is called taking the qibla or outlook thus the mohammedans of syria and those beyond it to the north having fixed the qibla 
are face to face with the northern wall sacred to the stone of ishmael and the gold rain spout their prayers are therefore sure to be heard those of persia turkestan northern india sind and a part of china look in the direction of the northeastern angle called the rokne aragi which is an equally blessed outlook since the door of the house is on the eastern side and rather more to the north than the south thereof the faces of the muslims of aden of southern india of madagascar and of australia are turned to the eastern wall or the southeastern corner of it while those of the faithful of constantinople as well as those of the mohammedans of some parts of russia are opposite to the western wall of the sacred building the boers believe themselves to be the chosen people it is a pity they are not mohammedans for if they were they would be considered now the chosen people of islam for the simple reason that they would face the southern wall of the kaaba wherein is laid the black stone of immemorial sanctity but the prayers the most acceptable to god when all is said and done are the prayers raised from any quarter within the harem of the house of allah on earth the interior of the kaaba is far more impressive than the exterior the silver threshold is reached by means of a staircase running on wheels there the pilgrim must prostrate himself asking god to grant him his heart's desire he must be careful to maintain the correct demeanour closing his eyes and lifting up his hands inasmuch as the angels who are believed to keep watch over the entrance are quick to resent the slightest breach in the prescribed ceremony the guide who accompanied me assured me of the fact he was good enough to see that i had forgotten neither my rosary of ninety-nine beads corresponding with the wondrous names of god used in prayer nor yet the lamp of clay called more whereon are stamped the self-same names together with those of the twelve imams and prophet it was on the clay that i bowed my head in contrition when i fell on my knees my guide who had also prostrated himself expressed the conviction on rising that the angels were on his side i was also about to declare myself to be on the side of the angels when a couple of sturdy pilgrims in their impatience to behold the light of their eyes wedged me tight between their bulky forms and then hustled me to the ground adding insult to injury by being obviously unconscious of the presence of my humble body they were absent-minded beggars with a vengeance when i had crossed the door sill i was overcome by a sense of my own unworthiness so that i pardoned the men who had offended me i raised my eyes the ceiling was flat and supported on three columns of aloe wood and from it hung vases of great beauty on delicate gold chains the walls were covered with red velvet save where in white squares were written in arabic characters the words allah ja jalala praise to god the almighty the velvet is said to have been a gift from sultan abdul aziz in the corner formed by the northern and eastern walls there is a door leading to the roof this door which is called the door of repentance is closed to the public but a prayer said on the hither side of the threshold meets with a gracious response and the pilgrim is clean washed of his sins if he but touch the wood with his hand the floor is now flagged with marble the work of some twenty years ago end of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain section eighty eight of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org arabia part two stories of the caliphs of baghdad historical note mohammed was succeeded by a line of caliphs who theoretically at least were at the head of both religion and state the greatest of these caliphs was harun al rashid who ruled from seven eighty six to eight o nine the hero of the arabian nights arabia was now in its most glorious days its caliph loved science and literature and he had the works of numerous greek and latin authors translated into arabic poetry flourished and the court of the caliph was the home of education as well as of luxury he had diplomatic relations with charlemagne and historians delight in describing the splendors of the embassy which he sent to that monarch and the superb presents which they carried among them was a magnificent tent a water clock and an elephant of more value than these however were the keys of the holy sepulchre at jerusalem for this gift carried with it freedom for european pilgrims to visit the sacred place from the eighth to the thirteenth centuries the arabs ruled nearly all the lands that had accepted mohammedanism one by one these countries were lost to their control and in the sixteenth century the caliphate passed for a time into the hands of the ottoman turks End of section eighty eight
This recording is in the public domain.